And now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, live from the Visual Arts Center, Golden Triangle Wood Turners is proud to present to you another outstanding celebrity group from Denton, right up there with the Brave Combo. For your and <laughs> They used to be my friends. <laughs> <laughs> and now for your entertainment <coughs> and education, we bring you the Bruised Brothers. Whoa, here they are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Solberg, and this is Peter Tax. And we are the Bruised Brothers. Uh, we got our name. <laughs> we got our name because, uh, as wood turners, uh, we've had a lot of experience with uh, getting bruises, uh, things flying off the lathe, and so we thought it was would be appropriate to uh, name ourselves the Bruise Brothers. Um, we started vacuum trucking uh, quite a few years ago when Peter and. And, and I were out one Christmas evening with our wives, and one of them is sitting here in front tonight. And uh, Linda asked Peter what he wanted for Christmas. And Peter said, I want a vacuum truck for my lathe. And she said, well, how much is it? And I said, oh, about six or $700. Guess who didn't get a vacuum truck for his <laughs> lathe that year? Well, Peter and I decided that uh, because of the, both of us wanting one, it would be prudent, prudent to uh, try and figure out how we could do it less expensively than trying to, to buy a commercial system. And so uh, after a lot of playing around and buying a few pumps and trying a few things, we came up with this system, and we're going to share it with you tonight. Can you go to the... Here we go. Well, we're not experts in this whole thing, but uh, we've been doing this a while, and we've turned a number of bowls uh, between us. And uh, so as we go through this, we're open to any kind of suggestions. If you've got any comments, holler at us, and we'll try to answer your questions. And uh, I think you'll find that when we get through here, you'll find the systems that we have here work just as well as any ones you can buy for a lot of money, and ours are a lot cheaper. So... We'll start that way. Yeah, if you have any questions, put it on a $20 bill and send it up, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try and get, get them answered. There's a few precautions that you need to worry about when you're working with a vacuum. And the biggest one is don't turn through the bottom of your work when it's on a vacuum. It, uh, it causes bruises. It causes things to come flying off the lathe. So be really careful with that. Um, make sure that your tools are sharp and you don't get a catch, because the catch can pull something off the lathe as well. You don't want to, you don't want to get hurt that way. And if you're turning um, spalted wood or really soft, punky wood, be careful because you're going to have some leakage through the wood and it may not hold nearly as well. Um, if you have a thin wall vessel and you use full vacuum, you may break it. And we're going to show you tonight how you can do that. We're going to crush a, a bowl. And you can see how little pressure it takes to do that. Um, you, don't want to make, you want to make sure that you don't have a power disruption while the lathe is, is running under vacuum. And my friend Peter has uh, some experience with that. Peter, you want to talk about that at all? No. Uh, <laughs> well, after we... After I built this system, or we built them, the first, the first bowl I had on there, I was turning, and uh, unfortunately, before, before turning off the lathe, I turned off the vacuum, and the and the bowl went zipping by my head. So, don't do that. Turn off the, the lathe and let it stop. Then turn off the vacuum. So another reason why we're called the Bruised Brothers. Okay, these are the uh, systems that we've built. We don't have all these systems, but we've 
built systems for all these uh, lays. And uh, you'll see as we go through here, there's a, a few differences in some of them. And so you'll have to buy uh, different size parts. But by and large, most of it's all the same. And it'll fit almost any lathe. And, and, if, and if you have a lathe that's not up there, then I guarantee you we can come up with a system that'll fit it. So uh, we'll go through the, and we're going to go through all these pumps here in a minute. Uh, we found that when you uh, go out to try and buy a vacuum system, they, they get pretty expensive. Uh, a retail value of a vacuum pump today, if, if a good one, if you look at Craft Supply or any of the the uh, wood turning stores runs somewhere between three seventy five and four hundred and fifty dollars, uh, and that's uh, the predominant item that you need for a vacuum system. And pumps are really expensive. Um, a vacuum adapter, something that fits on the end of the lathe that you can attach the the uh, the, the pump to, uh, runs anywhere from fifty five to one hundred dollars, depending on what you're looking at. A gauge kit um, can run you anywhere from $85 to $100 just to, to, to hook it up. And then a vacuum cylinder to hold your bowl onto the lathe is going to run anywhere from $70, 70 to $100 depending on the size that you're looking at. Most of them are aluminum, and we'll talk about that later. We don't, we don't use aluminum. Okay, the other parts, uh, the vacuum pumps, we got all our vacuum pumps on eBay. So you just have to get on there and start searching, uh, putting the search and then you start bidding on it or however, however you want to do it. But uh, you just sort of have to look. Sometimes there's a lot of them there and sometimes there's hardly any there. And the price varies. So that's where we bought all these pumps on eBay. And uh, we're, give or take a little, around the $100 range. The other parts you're gonna need is a lamp rod which you can buy at Home Depot in the lamp department. Now the thing about it is, here's one that comes with two, but on some lathes, like the one I have, I have a, a, a Powermatic 4224, and the, he the headstock's longer, and so I need a longer, so I, you can buy these there also, but you have to buy them separately. They don't come in a twofer here like this so one. So make sure if you buy a lamp rod, you buy it long enough to fit your lathe. The bearings, the bearings, we used to make a one bearing, uh, system and we found the with the newer bearings that they seem to leak a little bit so now we're going with a two bearing system same bearings we just put two of them on there and then we'll get in how we do all this in a minute uh, the vacuum gauges again we get those you can get them from a variety of places uh, we got most of these online on, on ebay if you look up here you'll find a variety of different kind of gauges so there's a lot of gauges available yeah just make sure it's it's for vacuum and uh and the valves we have right here, you can buy them at uh, Home Depot for, uh, I think, around eight bucks. You can get them at Harbor Freight for four. They work the same. So we get ours at Harbor Freight. And we use a two valve system. So, and we'll explain why. Right. Uh, the filters, we get, uh, well, you'll just have to look at them that are on. These are the. These are the mufflers, but there's also the filters, which are these little things right here. Uh, we get those uh, online. We get pretty much everything online on eBay or uh, somewhere online. There you go. There's a variety of different kind of filters you can use, but you need to use a filter. Uh, we say you, you wouldn't want to do this thing without a filter. The vacuum hoses, we get this at Home Depot. You can buy it by the foot. So figure out how you're going to do it. There's a, uh, well, this is one I, I have, and, and then there's one on the end down there that has stuff on it. So you just hook it up, buy you know, as many feet as you need, and fix it. And they, they just slide right on, and, you, and they, they fit all the parts. So it's real simple to do. And the other little pieces of hardware we'll talk about. Here's one of the things uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> fits on the, the end. This is a 90 degree that comes off the side, back on the side of the lathe, the way we set it up. And you can buy all these either at Home Depot or Lowe's, or you can buy them at, uh, 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 we, can, we get some of ours in, uh, online. There's a, you'll see some of these here with a four, this cross thing here. You can't buy those at Home Depot. We got those uh, pretty much online uh, out of a place in Canada. Is that correct, Canada? Uh, no, it came from Woodworker Joe. Wood, okay, Woodworker Joe's. Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, Foot length, uh, 
Home Depot, rather. Lowe's still sells it by the foot. Oh, thanks. So does Ace. Ace Hardware. OK. So all these things are readily available. Uh, they're just the brass parts. We're using quarter inch fittings on everything. Um, the only, only place we're not using the quarter inch is when we build the, the vacuum adapter. Uh, it has a half inch barb, and we do that so that it fits inside the, inside the bearings. Uh, the bearing has a half inch hole in it. So Let's Good. talk a little bit about types of pumps. Um, we've got most of them here. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is a diaphragm pump. And uh, that's what a diaphragm pump looks like. We'll, we'll go into each one of them in, in a minute. Let me just read through all of them, Peter. Okay. Um, diaphragm pumps, can we go back to the... Uh, then there's piston pumps, and we've got two or three of those. Uh, rotary vane pumps, we've got a couple of those. Um, uh, an oil air conditioner, an oil, oil bath. bath pump is a pump that is used in the air conditioning uh, system, and um, they work pretty good. There's some limitations to them. We'll talk about that. Uh, refrigeration pumps are pumps that come out of refrigerators. Question. We're going to talk about that. Okay. Talk about that on each one of them. And then there's a Venturi pump, which uses your air compressor to, uh, to provide the vacuum. And uh, then, then vacuum cleaners. There are some people that use vacuum cleaners. Uh, we don't recommend it. We'll talk about that here in a minute as well. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the diaphragm pump. And Peter's got an example of that here. There's an example up there. Um, it's, it's a good, it's a really good little pump. Um, it's used heavily in the uh, vacuum pressing industry where you want to put veneer on boards using a vacuum press. They're very reliable. They're fairly low CFM, usually one to three CFM per pump. So it, it's not the most ideal for vacuum chucking, but it does work well if you don't have porous wood and you don't have a lot of leakage in your system. And they're relatively available at uh, fairly inexpensive prices. You ready for me to turn it on? You want me to run it? Um, yeah, you can turn that one on. And that particular pump, what we got here? it's hooked up here, Peter. Huh? Oh, it's hooked up up there. There we go. That particular pump has got 1.9 CFM, so it, so it, it's it's a good reliable pump, and uh, we're gonna gonna use that tonight for a couple of demonstrations as well. The next pump uh, we'll talk about is a piston pump, and we've got three different piston pumps up here. Um, they're not as quiet as the uh, diaphragm pump. They're very readily used in uh, working with uh, vacuum clamping and vacuum systems. They have much higher CFM with, with uh, 2 to 5 CFM. And the black one up here has got a little over 5. And um, they're real reliable for working in, in olive woodworking and, I think, in, in wood turning. Here's a couple of the other ones that we have up here on display. You can see the black one has uh, 5.5 CFM and the, uh, the smaller one, and which is really one of my favorite pumps, has only got 1.75, and that's this one over here. Now let me turn them on so I can just hear yeah, it. Yeah, turn that one on. It's a real quiet pump. And that's, at, uh, that's at 26 pounds of pressure right there. And this one over here. Runs almost 30. It's, it's a real reliable pump, but it's, it's very low in CFM. The next pumps are the, probably the most popular pumps for wood turning. Um, the rotary vane pump, they're, depending on the horsepower, they have uh, the highest CFM of most pumps. Um, Anywhere from 
from 2.6 to uh, probably about 10. And uh, they're long life. One of the drawbacks of them is they do get hot when you use them. They're, they, they run on a, on a friction uh, vein inside, and so they tend to get hot because they're non-lubricated. Um, but they last a long, long time, and that's, that's probably the most popular pump you'll find in all the wood turning catalogs. But they, they tend to be much more expensive. We've got a small one over here. Peter, you want to yeah, pick it. that one up? And that one's running uh, 2.6 CFM. It's a little noisy. That was pulling to 27. And then Peter brought one of the pumps that he has. It's, it's a monster. Um, it's, uh, it's a really good pump. The only, the only problem with it is it's 220 volt. And um, it's the same pump that uh, we bought two of those on eBay. I think we paid about 50 or $55 a piece for them. If you can find them, I would recommend it if you can use a, a, a 220 volt pump. The problem, uh, if you can't, you know, it's a great pump for, for 220 volts. I run that on my Powermatic. Since Powermatic is 220 volt, I've got to have two, 220 at the, at the, the lathe. So that's the pump that I use on a regular basis. It, and it's really my favorite pump. Uh, the oil bath pump, as I mentioned, is a pump that is used, if you hire somebody to come fix your air conditioner, he will have one of these pumps. Um, it uses oil inside, and you can see at this point, this is the oil level within the pump. And you've got to maintain oil in there to make sure that it works properly. The idea of the pump is, it, is that it takes the moisture out of your air conditioning system and stores it in the oil. So if you're turning wet wood, it's going to pull moisture out of the wet wood and it's going to store it in that oil. So the only drawback is you need to change that oil periodically as it, as it gets contaminated. But they're good pumps. They're very, very reliable. Uh, Harbor Freight has got a couple of them that they sell for, I think one's $99 and the other's $139. And they run from 2 to 3 CFM. They're, they're good, reliable pumps. Uh, refrigerator pumps, uh, we don't recommend them. They're very quiet. Uh, we were giving this demonstration at another club, and one of the guys said that he was using one of these, and it was so quiet that he left it running for a week and didn't know it was running. <laughs> so uh, the biggest drawback with them is they're very low CFM. Uh, for those that don't understand CFM, that's cubic feet per minute of air flow through the pump. And you need a lot of CFM for wood turning. Uh, the more you can get, the better off you are. We're going to address that here in a little bit. Uh, the other problem is most of the time when you find these old refrigerator pumps, they may still have Freon in them. So you've got to worry about contamination of, of Freon. And they're very hard to make connections to. So it's, it's not something we recommend. Um, Venturi pumps are pumps that run off your air conditioner. And they use a air compressor. air compressor, thank you. Uh, they use a system called the Bernoulli system where it runs air across uh, an opening and, and that causes the vacuum. Um, they're very reliable except that you need a lot of, of, of air in your uh, air compressor to, to make them work. And um, we had uh, the one Peter held up, hooked up to my little two-tank air compressor, and, and it, would, it would never shut off. I mean, it just ran and ran and ran and ran. And um, I only bought that to see, what it, see how, how it would work. And, and they work fine, but if you have a huge air compressor and you want a really, really inexpensive pump, that's, that's one way of going. Chip, you had a one of these did you not and you had some problems with it drawing air too much air? It just stopped drawing air. It lost all vacuum. 
lost all vacuum pollutant. So it's, they're okay, we just don't recommend them because they take so much air. Uh, the last one, last type of pump is a vacuum cleaner. And there are lots of people that have tried using vacuum cleaners as, as a vacuum uh, on a lathe. It works. There are some real problems with it in that vacuum cleaners are designed to have air flow through them. And if you start blocking up that air, which you do when you put something on here, uh, you have a really good chance of burning that vacuum out. And uh, that's an expensive uh, replacement if you burn your vacuum out. Bill? I burned out two shop vacs doing that. Yeah, you, you, will, you will do that. And, yeah. and uh, not only, they give you good, good high CFM, but they don't give you a lot of volume for for that CFM. So you don't get a lot of, you only get about seven or eight inches of mercury. And uh, we don't think that's adequate. We don't recommend them. And uh, uh, besides that, they're really hard to hook up to your lathe. I mean, you can use a lot of duct tape trying, but uh, there's no readily made adapters to fit the lathe while, while it's spinning. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult pump to use and, and maintain. Okay, when we started doing this, uh, we decided we were going to make a system that would fit any lathe. And so that's why we started with what you're looking at up here. And uh, we start with a, a block of wood. We use maple because we like it, but just a square piece of wood. And then we turn it, and there's going to be a diagram coming up next that how to make this. But uh, you, you turn this, if you follow the diagram, it's got a couple of little uh, ledges in here that you have to make. And when you end up putting this lamp rod in here, there's two... Uh, two nuts on here that you put together, then you epoxy it in there, and you got to make sure you leave the room for the air, so don't close it up. Uh, we put the two bearings on, as I talked about before. These two bearings, and we buy. This is the part you bought from Canada, right? Yes. The part we bought from Canada, and you see it's all, it's flattened here. This used to have uh, threads on it, but we flatten it so that it just barely fits on here. And John's going to show you that. Um, there's not a Trying, trying to figure out how to hold these when you're trying to make them flat so they'll fit the bearing, is, it's not easy. But if you take the jaws off your chuck, they fit in there just very nicely. And uh, most, most everybody has a four-jawed chuck, and if you take the jaws off, you can fit it in there. It fits in, it spins wonderfully, and you can get it so it spins absolutely perfectly true. And then you just take a file as it's spinning and just work it flat until you get it so it just fits inside the bearing. Yeah, just test it as you go along. Why don't you pass those around? Well, hang on, we'll do, do the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, then after. After that, uh, we also have some other, other, you don't have to use wood. Here's one, now this is a one bearing system that we built earlier, but uh, you can't, this is made out of Corian, and it works just fine also. Uh, this is John's, and he put a little indent in here with a little rubber uh, ring, which keeps the pressure in. One of the problems I had is it used to have two uh, O-rings, and when I cut the groove for the O-rings, I cut it a little bit too deep. So when I tried to put it on, it just it, it broke off. It still works with one O-ring, but uh, not near as well as it did with two. We also have a commercial one you can buy that looks like this. Uh, we got this from JT Turning Tools, and this is about 65 bucks, but it's, it's still got the two little rings like John said. It's got the headstock. Now the, the, and it's got two bearings. And it's got two bearings. The, and the reason you can use this on some lays, and on some lays you have to, you have to use this, on, on, uh, on this lathe and on a Powermatic and on a number of the big lathes, the headstock is solid, so you don't lose any air when you put this in, and so it's sealed. But on some lathes, it's not solid. In that case, you have to use a lamp rod or, or some version like this to keep the air so it comes through. Otherwise, obviously, you can't get a vacuum. So that's the reason you may need to use this. But these are very, these aren't hard to make, okay? So they're, they're and, but they're lathe specific. You have to make them to fit your lathe and, and each of the, the back part of the headstocks are a little bit different, so you just make it to fit in the back, and then 
uh, design this thing as you're going to see in the next chart. And John's going to talk about that. This is a complete system that I just built for a uh, Delta Mini lathe. So you can use it. You can make these for just about any lathe you. I'm going to pass these around. Yeah, pass that one around too. Uh, yes. <coughs> yes. The question was on on the 1642. The, yes, you need the lamp rod. It has a very small hole in the in the back end of it, so uh, you can see there's just a, a just a little brass nub that fits in that back hole. But that's that's for the delta. Phil. Have not. That's a really small hole. Yeah, I, I, and I don't know of anybody that's got a lathe that like that. So, question was: <laughs> Phil does. Have, have, have I done any for a number one Morris taper instead of a number two? And and uh, uh, we've not done that. John's going to go in on the next one and show you the diagram of how we, we he, he computed this thing, and then we'll go through uh, slides on show you the picture of how they're made. I started. Uh, initially, and Peter took the one I have. Let's see. Uh, in, initially, I started out with a with a two and a half inch piece of solid maple, and I've since cut that down to probably about two inches. Uh, you don't need two and a half. Um, you have to drill it out so that you get the uh, hole here in the center for the lamp rod. And uh, you adjust this diameter to fit your lathe. And so it, it says it's, I think, 5 eighths of an inch in diameter. Yeah. But um, you have to make an adjustment for that to, to, so it fits your lathe. The bearings go in in this back section here, and they sit on this inside portion that's a little bit smaller in diameter. And then the nuts on the back of the lamp rod fit in the, in the recess down on the bottom of, the, of this. I'll pass that one around too. Is there any questions about that? I mean, they're, they're fairly simple to make. It's, it's a matter of just chucking it up and, and, and drilling. We're going to, sorry. Mike. Where do you get some of that corn in that? My garage? Uh, out of Pete's garage, <laughs> we we found a guy that had uh, some scrap corian from a a dealer, and and he gave it some. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'll help. We're going to go through in the next few slides and just show pictures of what we just talked about. So it may be a little, it may be helpful for you. This is the, you know, what we're passing around. And as I as I talked about before, you put the. The two nuts on the, on the lamp rod, and it fits into the bottom part, like John just showed you, and you epoxy it in and just let that set up. And it has to go all the way down there and just make sure you get the epoxy down in and it doesn't fill in the hole. This is what a, a complete unit looks like. Um, once you um, put that um, brass fitting on the end, you, you then have a, a way of, of running the air through the lamp rod into the, uh, into the headstock so that, uh, that you can get vacuum onto the, onto the piece you're trying to work with. This is a number two Morris taper, if you have a number two Morris taper on your, on your headstock here. That's the same piece that John's got here. This is a, uh, not made out of wood, but you can make it out of almost anything that fits. Looks like this. And you, you can see all we're doing is, is making something that will hold it centered in the, in the headstock. It doesn't need to be sealed or any of that kind of stuff because the air is going through the lamp rod, so it doesn't really matter. It just has to fit in there so that it's comfortable and, and uh, fits nice and, nice and snug. This was the first one I built. Uh, this one was, was designed for a Powermatic. And uh, until I got the uh, aluminum one from uh, JT Turnings, uh, I use this one exclusively, and it works really, really well. So this is the addition of the uh, part I showed you earlier. Here. Oh, there we are. 
you just add this on the end of the, the piece that, that John just showed you, make a 90 degree and you have your valve right here. We, we like to use a two valve system. You want to talk about that, John? We use a two valve system for, for two reasons. Uh, one, it allows you to control the amount of vacuum and the other valve, uh, that's the valve on the, on the pump itself, allows you to control the amount of vacuum and, the, and we have one on the, the lathe itself and that controls, it works like an on-off switch. So you can just instantly turn the vacuum off and take your piece off to if you want to readjust, uh, relocate it or take it off your lathe without turning the pump off, you can do that with, with the, the valve that we have on, on the, the headstock itself. Yeah, you can make this with a one valve system. It, I mean, there's nothing, there's no requirement that it has to have two valves. We just like it that way because we have more options of what we can do with it. But if you make it with a one valve system, you want to make sure you put the valve on the pump so that you can control the amount of airflow um, that comes through your vacuum. And we'll show you that in a little bit where we're going to crush a bowl and we're going to do it with very little vacuum pressure. And um, so if you've got a, a, a pump that produces 25 inches of mercury and you use it on a thin wall bowl, there's a really good chance that you'll, you'll crush the bowl. So here's the, here's the headstock uh, with that adapter that we put on, just, and that's just to hold the lamp rod in place and center it in the, uh, in the headstock. Okay, this is uh, the commercial uh, one we showed you. There's, this one's made so that it fits onto the, the little handle thing there. The one we have just slides right in uh, with the little uh, rings on it to keep the vacuum. So there's a couple of different kinds of that. Yeah, the handle down in the far right hand corner is for this particular lathe, the Jet uh, 1642. Um, it has a rather large hole in it and so um, this supplier, uh, JT Turnings, has have made a new uh, adapter for the for the end of it with a smaller hole, so that this this uh, standard piece that he makes fits into it. And that's so. You, depending on the lathe, you may need to buy the extra fitting in order for this to fit into. We we make a variety of chucks. Uh, you can buy the ones uh, like One Way has. They're all aluminum and they're pretty and stuff. Ours aren't so pretty, but they're just as functional. And so you can see there's a whole set I made. Those are every size that you can get at Home Depot for PVC. So you can put a lot of bowls of different, whatever comes up, you can have it uh, the size you need to fit it. There's a, a variety of ways that you can put these together. Uh, all of the ones Peter has, uh, I shouldn't say all of them. Most of them that Peter has down there are, are threaded in the back using uh, standard taps that fit, uh, fit the lathe. This is an inch and a quarter eight tap. Uh, this tap is, is an inch eight for the smaller lathes like the, like the Jet or the Delta uh, mini lathes. Uh, so we, we tap the back of it. We cut a groove in the side of, of the blank to fit a uh, PVC uh, connector into, and then epoxy it in place. And um, there are several different ways of doing that. This one I did by, and Peter's done on most of his, by cutting a groove in here and forcing this down inside the groove and then epoxying it in place. Here's one where I took and I turned it down to the exact dimensions of the inside of the of the plastic connect or PVC connector, and epoxied it in. And I'm working on a new one where I just cut a, a slot on the top and set it on, and we'll put epoxy that in place. And then we just glue a a piece of funky foam or some sort of sealing material on the top of it to to make it work. The other. The other option is that you can buy a, a one eight nut, or you can buy a one and a quarter eight, which is what this is, and use it to, to, to cause it then just screws right on your lathe. Uh, I did this one and then 
The rest of them I just did turning with a, with a tap because I thought it was a lot easier. If, if you do it this way, at least for me, and you got to cut out the little, if you, if you want to do it the way I do it, you cut out the little corners on the, on the nut and it's a real pain. And then you got to get it in there straight and, you, and it still may wobble a little bit and you have to turn it. It's easier just to tap it. So I only did one this way. Vols? Uh, yeah, we'll get. To, we recommend that you don't use PVC pipe. These are PVC couplers, and this is an electrical coupler uh, for electrical conduit. Um, they're much more robust. They're they're thicker, and the chances of them collapsing or breaking are, are really 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 remote. So we recommend not using the pipe itself but using the, the PVC couplers. And they're relatively cheap. I just bought this one um, the other day for $1.75. So they, they don't cost a lot of money. And they make really good vacuum trucks. John was talking earlier about the, the funky foam. We've, we've tried a variety of different kind of things, like a shelf liner for your tool chest and a variety of different things we've found around. But then we discovered that if you go to Hobby Lobby and buy some funky foam, it's much simpler. <laughs> So we do that now, and I think, are you going to show them now how to do that? We can. Does anybody want to see how to mount funky foam onto a chuck? We can, we can do that we real, it won't take very long. real quick. We cut a square piece out already off of that. And so all you do is put a... I'm going to, I'm going to take this one off. Yeah, let's get, move some of this out of here. We've also got a few handouts. We'll hand out at the break. We probably should have done it earlier, but it's okay. Plus, this this whole demonstration is going to be on the website, so you'll be able to you'll be able to see it all. You won't be able to see us talking, so you're really going to miss it. And but I, I'm just going to take a skew, and I'm going to go in at 90 degrees, and take this off, and then just flatten out the top of it. I'm going to talk about some of this stuff later, but you can screw that up. Ask me how I know. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do um, that. It comes under the bruised. I, I, yeah, very much so. I would not do this with a gouge. Um, this, because this is what will happen. This material is soft enough that it will grab a gouge and it will, <laughs> it will cut major pieces out of it and uh, can cause a lot of problems. So. I'm not sure why all these things I'm going to show you later that are things not to do are mine, <laughs> but they are. <laughs> so Peter, you want to just put a, yeah. we're, going to, we're just going to take and put a, a gob of uh, medium CA glue. Did you bring any? Uh, A, a, a gob is uh, just a little more than a skosh. Can I bring water? Any accelerator? No, you didn't tell me to bring one. Okay. So we're just going to put that, just a light bead all the way around. Now I would recommend putting some accelerator on there. So we're going to let it sit a little bit and talk, talk about some other things, and then we'll come back to that. That foam does come with a sticky pack, but don't talk. Don't, it's, we, we recommend yeah. glue. Yeah. 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 Just, just, funky foam, I don't, well, it might. I don't think funky foam comes with, if you. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. See, CA glue works really, really well. Here's uh, one of the things that uh, we've learned. Don't use MDF on any of these trucks. Um, <clears throat> Peter, you want to talk about that big one as well? I do. MDF uh, has no lateral strength, and it leaks really bad. MDF, don't use that. But that's not what happened to this one. I thought I was doing really well, and I, it was. And I put this all on there, except that if you turn it this thin, 
it wobbles. So don't turn it, you know, this is a lot better, you know. Not, like, o- not only if you turn it that thin, but you put a lot of pressure on it and you're going to collapse it. Yeah, so that's what's wrong with this one. Um, Other than that, it might have been okay. That's just a. You can use a faceplate on the back. Just a faceplate. You, yeah. you don't have to tap them. You know, use a faceplate. You can use, you can use a nut, an inch and a quarter eight nut or a, a one eight nut. They all work fine. So we're going to let that glue sit a minute. And we'll do it at the end. And we'll talk a little bit about this chart. And I think this is one of the most important parts of vacuum chucking. If you have a bowl that's nine inches in diameter and you put it on a faceplate vacuum chuck that's nine inches in diameter and you put 25 inches of mercury on it, at nine inches, at 25 inches of mercury, you have 964 pounds holding that on. The size of that little hole doesn't matter. What matters is how much it's open underneath it. This is all air pressure, and it's pounds per square inch on this side of the, of the turning. And so you end up with a tremendous amount of force holding this piece on. If you use this kind of a faceplate, that's why we recommend some of these smaller chucks, because if you take this down now to six inches holding it on, you can see six inches at 25 pounds is 347. Three, three only 340 pounds. <laughs> so chances are this would hold 340 pounds. You don't need that. Um, it would easily hold on here with 150 pounds of pressure. So at 150 pounds, we could be at at 12 and a half inches of mercury or something of that sort. And though that's why we, in, we like systems that have bleeder valves on them so that you don't have to run them at full vacuum. Um, it can get really dangerous if you're trying to take the bottom of a bowl off and you've got 25 inches of mercury on a six inch bowl and you get it really, really thin you're going to go, it's going to suck the bottom of that ball off and it's going to come flying off the lathe. And so you got to be really careful about pressure when you're using vacuums. Um, I don't like going much over 200 to 250 pounds. So if, if you drew a, a line up there, um, about a diagonal. Diagonally. I would, again, I wouldn't, if you have less than 75 pounds, I wouldn't turn it. I think that's a great area. We could do other, that. The other part. The other part, when you're turning off the bottom, you, usually we're doing this, you turn the bowl over and you turn it off the foot or something like that. You know, especially if it's not up in the high range and you, you can't get it that way for some reason, then I always try to turn it when I'm, instead of turning across it, I try to push in. That way you're, you're, not, you're not fighting the pressure. If you push in against the lathe, it's just, it, it's helped. And also, if you can, leave the tailstock up as long as you can if, if you're worried about it right at the end. So that, those are two things you ought to think about when you're doing that. Um, Faceplate vacuuming is, can be really dangerous because, uh, as I said, if you put, if you put a nine-inch bowl on, on a faceplate, you, you can end up having so much pressure on here. We're going to do this. We're going to run a little experiment. Peter, take that out. It's a little plastic bowl. And I'm going to ask Peter. There will Peter be no to, laughing at this point. I'm going to ask Peter to put that down on the ground and stand on it. It doesn't see, collapse. It doesn't collapse. Near 190 pounds. Careful. <laughs> careful. <laughs> At one time. Peter, you want to run the uh, run that? 
Now we're going to put it on this face plate. Three. Yeah. Now I have the valve on this is now wide open, but I'm getting a little bit of vacuum through here, and it's just enough to hold this on. And Peter, can you read what's on that on yeah. that gauge? Yeah, it's uh, it's right about two pounds right now. So, so I'm I'm going to go up one pound at a time. But you see, at two pounds, if I don't get this on tight, I can I can pull it off. So go up to about five pounds, Peter. Now this is a six inch bowl. This is what's good about having the second valve. You can control this. This is a six inch bowl and I'm at five pounds. There's about 75 or 70 pounds holding this on and I can't pull it off. If I work on it hard enough, I might be able to. But that's on it at roughly about 70 pounds. Now, I'll bring it up to seven and a half pounds. Can you get on that gauge? Okay, that's seven and a half pounds. No, this one, there you Mike, go. Mike over here. That's it, he's got it. Yeah. Okay. Inches of mercury is we what it is. We can't, you won't, you won't be able to see both that and this at the same time. So those of you over here, we'll do it, we'll do it twice and we'll bring the camera in so you can see this. But at seven and a half pounds, we've got about a hundred pounds holding this on, and I can't pull it off. Okay, take it up to take it up to ten or eleven pounds. There's ten. At ten pounds, I've got 140 pounds on here, holding this in place. I would turn this every day with 140 pounds. No problem. A little bit more. There's 11. 11 starting to deform really bad. There it goes. At 12 pounds, it's going to collapse. Is it already collapsed? It's pulled in now completely. There's 12. At 12 pounds. So you can see what, if we had, if we had been running this at 25 pounds, you can see it's and it had been a thin walled bowl, it would have been gone. Try to try to get the camera on the other end. Then so we'll if you can put the camera back on here, Mike. There you go. Are you back at zero? Yeah. Okay, we're going to put it back on. Now slowly bring it up. Read, read the pressure as you There's go. There's four. There's five. Six. Seven. Eight, nine, ten. There, there it goes. At ten pounds, it's eleven. At eleven pounds. So you see, it it held Peter at 190 pounds, but he was only standing on this outside edge. And now you've got the vacuum pressure Thanks. over this whole surface. So at at 10 pounds on a six inch bowl, you got about 140 pounds. And that was a lot less than Peter weighed. And uh, we were able to collapse. I like the way you said that. So that's, that's the key have about having a, a relief valve on your system because otherwise you're going to have a, a potential of, of uh, doing some serious damage. Yeah. The other thing, if you're going to do a faceplate, because that's hard to set on here, you can, if you put little lines on it, it's a lot easier to line up the bowl. You still won't get it perfect probably, but you get it pretty close. And the other way is always put a, when you're turning a bowl, always put a little indentation in the back side. Use your tailstock into that indentation and it'll, you'll, it'll center itself pretty well. Or the other way, which which is what I like to do, I take it off the off the uh, headstock with the chuck still on it, and I have a thing uh, for my tailstock that uh, I can screw onto the tail to the headstock, and I can just put it or screw onto the tailstock, and I screw it onto the back of that that chuck, 
and just put it up there and it's always perfectly centered when I put it on. That's, that's what I like to do. This is a bowl that uh, I turned quite a while ago and it's, the wood is really porous. And uh, Peter, let's put this on and give me full vacuum on, on, on that. You ready? Yeah. What are we getting? Five. See, if there's enough leakage in this bowl that I don't have enough cubic feet per minute on that pump you bring tape? to get any more than five pounds of, of vacuum on here, or, or five inches of, of, of mercury on this. Um, if I could find the, the leakage spots and put tape over it, is that gauge moving at all? No. Now, this thing is so leaky that that's, this is the porous wood I was talking about earlier. Unless you have enough of volume in your pump, you don't want to turn this kind of wood unless you want to put a seal coat on here. Now here's, here's another bowl that's a lot thinner, but it's, it's, it's got a, a, a sanding sealer put on it first. So we'll put that on. Ready? How far up you want to go? There's uh, 10. That's 10? Uh-huh. Yeah, 11. And, and see, this is about an 8-inch bowl. So I've got, um, I got 250 pounds holding this on right now. I don't want to put any more of it on. It's a pretty thin, thin bowl. But see the difference between sealed wood and porous wood. Um, where you just can't get the volume through your pump system if, if you, uh, I'm talking about total pounds. It is pounds per square inch, but, it, but that chart is taking it and multiplying it by the, see, the atmospheric pressure is 14.7 pounds per square inch. And so now you've got to figure out what the square inch of, of that surface is. And it's, it's atmospheric pressure that's holding it on. It's not the vacuum. It's, it's the atmospheric pressure that's doing it. And, and, and P equals? pi r squared times 0.491 hg, just so you know. That's the formula, if, if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, I think it's about a half a pound. Correct. Yeah. And, and you see, then we're, then we're adding to that inch of mercury vacuum so that you've got to multiply it times the, the vacuum pressure times the, the square inch of the, of the surface area. The moment of inertia? Uh, hey, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Guest speaker. <laughs> the easiest way of cutting this stuff is just turn the lathe on, take a really sharp skew. And it cuts perfect circles. Now, I'm still getting a lot of fumes off of this because we didn't have any accelerator. And then you do the same thing on the inside. Have a really sharp skew. Just push it in. And it's done. Pretty easy. And save the piece for the smaller, for the smaller chucks. This is another nice circle. Any questions? Sure. You, yeah, you can do that. It doesn't matter how much you leave in there because all you need is just a little bit of hole to get the vacuum. His comment was he leaves this uh, funky foam or the sealing material a little wider so that it conforms to the inside of the bowl when you're doing it and uh, gives, perhaps gives you a little bit better seal, less leakage, whatever. Eventually, those will. If you use one a lot, it'll it'll mess up, and you just have to replace it. But you, you, how you saw it, it's very simple to do. And I really like these kind of 
kind of chucks because you can you can give me a lot of pressure now. It's five. You see, they hold really well. Need some pressure. What do we got there? 14, 13. 13 or 14. That's, um, yeah, I'm sitting here at about 100 pounds holding this bowl on, this plastic bowl. <laughs> Dale. What's the main advantage over Smith and the cold job, uh, cold job? This is the main easier. advantage of a vacuum over cold jaws. Uh, number one, cold jaws, you have to sit there and adjust them for every size you're going to use. Number two, they have little rubber things that stick out to, to hold your bowl in place, and it doesn't hold very securely. Um, I would, if you're going to Take the bottom off with cold jaws. I do it at a much slower speed than what you turn at, just because cold jaws are, are rubber and they, they tend to give. Um, this gives you a, a much more reliable system than cold jaws. Okay. You had a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, the, you guys said you use maple for your uh, wooden parts there. Do you have to seal that or anything? I would seal it. I seal it with CA. Yeah. CA or good Put it all over the outside. Or good sanding sealer. Yeah, absolutely seal it. Maple end grain is going is, is gonna to leak, no matter what size. Even the one... I have not... I, when I first started doing it, I, sell, I sealed the threads, but I don't anymore. No. I still do. I still... Yeah. When he... For those for sealing threads, I just put in thin CA glue in there, then run the tap back through it once it dries. <coughs> then it'll be sealed. Um, we can talk about. It. Let me go through a couple of these things down here. I talked about a couple of mistakes already. I'll finish up. This was the first thing I ever vacuum chucked. It used to have more. Peter, bring it back. Used to here. have more segments on it. Peter, bring it back here so we oh, can get sorry. it on camera. It used to have more segments on it. That's the one that I turned off the uh, vacuum before I turned off the lathe. And then it went by and there's less segments now. If you turn a really thin bowl, this one's pretty thin, I turned, and I didn't get it on straight, okay? And I didn't get it on straight when I was turning the back side of it. And so what happened was, you can see I had a hole there, it didn't cut it all the way off because it's, it's a little bit thick, because I had it off center. So it caught this side first. Well, as soon as that happened, it went by me also. These are just things you should not be doing. <laughs> so, okay, that's enough. I surrender. I surrender. <laughs> the last slide that, that uh, we have up here is just a, a list of resources. And uh, that list is in the handout. Uh, that if, if you want one, take one. I don't think we have enough for everybody. But it's on the website, as we It'll say. It's on the website. Uh, if you plan on making one, it's got the instructions on, on how to make the adapters and that sort of thing in there. Um, Phil, question. There's a place on the internet called the Surplus Center, and they commonly have the gas vacuum pump for about $100. Uh, Phil mentioned the Surplus Center. It's on the website. Uh, they commonly have gas pumps, and I highly recommend gas pumps. Um, and they're usually somewhere around $100. You got to be careful. Most of the what they have are 220 volt pumps. Surplus, uh, center. surplus center. The other thing, if you're looking for pumps on eBay, and I've spent an exorbitant amount of time looking at pumps on eBay. He has. Uh, be careful because there's a lot of the pumps on eBay that say they're 50 cycle pumps. They're made for Europe. They don't run on 60 cycles here in the in the states. So make sure that the voltage and the frequency uh, of those pumps are what you're looking at. Uh, don't, don't make the mistake of buying a 50-cycle pump and getting it and trying to use it on 60 cycles because it will not work and you'll damage the pump. But if you do, just put it right back on eBay. And <laughs> you, can, you can hope somebody else will buy it, yeah. But, 
but there, there are a lot of pumps on eBay that are 50 cycle pumps, so be careful if you're buying one. We also had, Joel, you want to bring up here too? Here's another way to do the, uh, Joel, you want to bring those up? This is another way, I meant to, yeah. we meant to say something earlier, forgot. Joel does his a little different, so he can uh, show you how he does his. I designed these just to fit right into my Look, you the hand mic. Get, John, you got the hand mic? He needs the hand mic. Thank you. Uh, I designed these just to fit Not right on. on. Chuck. Yes? Why? Could you turn the mic on? Mike. Oh, I thought you did. It's on. It says on. Okay. I designed this to fit into my four jaw chuck so I thought it would be a little bit easier than the uh, mechanism to put onto a spindle. So you just slide this in, tighten down your chuck on the base and you're ready to go. Uh, got a threaded rod and, and, and I have a Powermatic uh, 3420 uh, uh, and it's just a simple spindle adapter. You can use the one the other guys are showing. Uh, but I just thought that this is an easier way of uh, putting this on your headstock just using again your four jaw chuck putting it in there. And uh, again, since the guys are using uh, adapter pipes and I used a, a transition, I put a separate piece of PVC inside so it gives me a double thickness and that makes it easier for the sticky foam and here I just use a mouse pad uh, to uh, hold on to the edge instead of that skinny edge because I had a, a problem when I put this into a round bowl uh, the uh, uh, adhesive would move and uh, the sticky foam would come inside and I'd have a ring of adhesive inside my bowl. So by double thickening this and putting in a second piece of pipe inside, it gives me a double width purchase and it holds it a whole lot better than what I used to have. One other thing I just say, because I know I did it, if you, if you, have, if you have a bowl on there and you've got it under vacuum, and you still want to put some finish on it on the outside or something like that and it's a thin bowl and you're putting it on the end grain when you take it off all that finish you didn't very nice on the inside will have that finish with it and you won't, it, you'll have to start over again because all that not all of it but all, finish will come through the bowl and come into the inside that you already finished don't do that <laughs> I, I, I'm just here for comedy relief <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A year ago, uh, I bought this pump here in the middle on uh, eBay, and I got a really good deal on it. And I noticed that the guy had a bunch of them, so I went back to him and I said, "You know, what do you what do you want for ten of them?" So I bought ten of these silly pumps. The first one worked out so well. The others came in and. Uh, Six of them were junk, absolutely junk. They were sitting in the garage, we're gonna scrap them out. The other four I brought tonight, if anybody wants any, wants them, they work really well. Um, I have adapter kits with them, uh, a meter. The only thing you need to buy is the lamp rod and a couple of the uh, relief valves from Harbor Freight. And uh, so they are available if, if somebody's interested. I think there are a couple left. Um, one of the pumps is, is Peter's. I think he's wanting a little bit more for it. But uh, so we do have a couple pumps left over there. Where's the availability for the new capacitor? The best place I know of for capacitors is, is either online or uh, Radio Shack. Our surplus centers got surplus centers got a, a good supply of as well. Yeah, you could probably get down to uh, uh, the appliance store downtown and ask if they've got capacitors and tell them approximately what you want. They'll probably have it. Question. Yeah, Granger. Yeah, the comment is the Granger down I-35 would have them. Any other questions? Were the holes in the valve doors in the back? Okay. How does that go in? It's just a friction fit. I just. 
How does the my question is how does this elbow spin? Is it there's, the, 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 there's a bearing the, here and there's space between them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you cement the bearing in. You cement the outside of the bearing in. Yeah, keep the epoxy and, off the inside. And, of the bearing. and there is space in there, so you've got to seal this adapter so, so that it doesn't leak as well. So CA glue or a good wood sealer on it. There is there is some space inside. Yes, sir. Where do you guys get your bearings? Uh, buy them online. Purvis bearing here in Denton has them. Purvis Purvis has them. Um, I've got a few up here if you want want some bearings. VX bearing online is about the cheapest place. Um, VX. VX bearing online. Um, the problem is if you buy one or two, you get you, you really get nicked by uh, shipping. by shipping. So you know I I bought for when I put kits together for the pumps and all of these, I bought you know 20 or 30 of them, and and I still have a few. So if you're interested, you know. You want a double sealed bearing, and it and the the ones we use. <coughs> that have the half inch hole are 1621 double sealed. So if you can see the balls in there, that's probably not a good bearing. No, <laughs> no. If you can see the balls inside the bearing, don't use them. Purvis here in town is a good source for bearings. They're expensive. I paid uh, 13 or $14 for one. And I'm buying them for right around five dollars online. They're you can get they're up to seventeen. Yeah, you can get them for a couple of bucks online. Glenn says you can get them at VX Bearing for a couple, two or three dollars. But you got to pay shipping. Yeah, plus so. shipping. Yeah, but what size are they? That's the key. They're about the same size. As what are they? Yeah, they can't be about though. They got to have a half inch center shaft. So. You can find a Anything else? <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we're done. Thanks.